Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's HBO's original series, Watchmen, starring Regina King. Season one, episode six, entitled This Extraordinary Being. Now, didn't I say for you to be patient? Didn't I say to let this series grow and develop on its own timing and to be patient and learn the characters slowly but surely? This episode was a huge payoff a lot of things learned the cinematography was movie-esque perfect in just a television series absolutely amazing i'll do a recap of the entire episodes with pictures that will be offset to the side and the review at the end that's all coming up next It's Bunny. <laughs> Opening scene, we see the words Watchmen very bold across the screen. And as quickly as it appears, it disappears by the sound of someone blowing cigarette smoke and then evolving into Minutemen. And we entered this interrogation room where we see this hooded mask vigilante who we've seen in previous episodes. And he's being inter interrogated by two detectives. And he says, wow, hmm. hooded justice. You know, it all started with you. It all began with you. Thanks to you, a lot of bad men have been put in into jail and not just by you but by the minute man and wow to have you here and many people around me we always wanted to know what the noose around your neck meant and i thought it was because you were an executioner but you know my partner here jerry he thinks it means something else jerry why don't you let him know what you think the noose means and jerry says sex stuff He's like, yeah, Jerry thinks it's sex stuff. And the mask Vincelandi says, what do you want from me? And he lets him know that we need your help in something critical. See, your, your lover, you know, um, Metropolis, AKA Mr. Gardner, he has this film that we found that was in a safe behind this picture that was on the wall, this white horse. And you know what that film had? It was a film of him, you know, doing the do with someone that looks really close to Director Hoover. But it can't be Director Hoover because, you know, he's not involved with such disgusting, you know, stuff as this, this homosexuality activity. So what we need you to do is we need you to go in and to break in and get this film and in exchange for that we'll tear up the picture that we're going to take of you once you remove that mask so that's the incentive we need to see your face take a picture in that of that and we'll swap that once you get that film once you retrieve that film for us and the hooded vigilante says what makes you think that i can trust you how do you know that i can trust you and they say well you really don't have a choice because this is what we need and this is what you need in order for your little secret not to come out. So the vigilante goes to his head, he snatches off the mask and we see a face. And just when the detective is about to take a photo of him and capture the moment, the hooded vigilante and the two detectives, they are going at it and he proceeds to beat him up and do all this other stuff so he can make his escape. And after he proceeds to whoop tail, we have the detectives that are on the ground and the guy looks at the camera and says, jeez. <laughs> we cut to present day and we see that it is cops in the office watching the American hero story in the office and they're watching it on TV and they hear this cheesy narrative voiceover saying I should be worried that I killed two federal agents but I'm more worried about my lover Nelson Gardner that he was cheating on me <laughs> and agent Blake she walks into the office and she tells the officers turn that crap off okay she walks to another room and she sees that there are cells down there where people are being held and one of the officers says you know 
Agent Blake, like, we, we, we got to release her to the hospital. She really needs her stomach pump. She could go into a coma. And he, she says, I know. Look, I just need to talk to her. So she goes into the back area. And we can see that Angela is in the cell. And she's being held. She's distorted. She's sweating. Uh, she can barely contain herself. And Agent Blake leans over and says, look, we need you to sign this form, okay, to allow us to pump your stomach because if that nostalgia is still in your system, you can go into a coma, you can be a vegetable, so I need you to sign this. And Angela is pulling back because she has this energy like she really wants to see whatever nostalgia that she can see and she's holding back and she doesn't want to sign the consent form. And Agent Blake continues to go on and say, Look, Angela, you've got to do this. Taking somebody else's nostalgia is bad, very, very bad. And do you want to know why that this was outlawed? It was outlawed because a company wanted people to remember their thoughts. And it was just a bad market because young people, it really didn't reach them because they said, well, why live in the past when I can live in the now? Because they're young and they have plenty of time to live and think about their future. So it was a really popular market between the people that were older, elderly elders that really wanted to take the nostalgia, but it was dangerous. And what made it dangerous, the first part is they would insert these chips into your head to contain all of your thoughts. And people would get so consumed with taking these pills that it would put them into a coma and people would OD because they kept consuming all of these memories. If you don't sign this consent form, you'll be a vegetable and you won't remember anything, Angela. Angela and she's continuously trying to get her to snap out of it but Angela is going deeper and deeper into another state of thought into this nostalgia Angela is now deep in the nostalgia state where she's seeing herself back in a period of time 1938 to be more specifically and she's dressed as a cop in 1938 when they're having a ceremony ceremony for cadets that have been inducted into the police academy. She sees the sign behind them. There are a line and roll of gentlemen that are being inducted and there she is the only black person that is there. So the shot allows us to see this is Angela seeing this memory, but it is Will, the person that has this memory. And as they walk down congratulating each and every cop. They then skip Will. All of the things that they're saying was congratulations and they're putting a badge on their shoulder, letting them know how proud they are that now they are in this academy, now they are a police officer, congratulations. It gets to Will and they purposely skip Will and go to the next person. But what happens, there is a black cop that says, well, it's me that's gonna congratulate you and congratulations. And he mimics the motion of actually placing a badge on his chest firmly with his fingers so he can feel this is where your badge was supposed to go. And Will says, you know, it's because of you that I wanted to enter the academy after, you know, fighting. And the officer says, well, I'm sorry to hear that. And he leans over to Will's ear and says, beware of the cyclops and he quickly pulls away and will says what what did you say to me and the black officer says congratulations shakes his hand firmly and walks away later on that evening will he meets, meets with june to have dinner and she doesn't look like she's too flattered and will says i'm so happy that you were there with the ceremony and i'm happy that you were doing a story about me and she says no well, the story wasn't about you it was about the event in its entirety you know amsterdam you know they wanted me to do an article about negroes who are now on the police force and she doesn't look too flattered and will says well why don't you go ahead and say it and she says well say what and he is egging her on to say well why don't you really say how you feel she says, well, you're an officer and they gave you a gun and a stick. And it really doesn't change anything. And Will seems really conflicted with that because he's saying, okay, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that I'm this token and maybe they've let me in the academy because I'm this token representative or it's for, you know, promoting or that I'm just some type of advertisement of things beginning to change and make a change. And she says, well, I mean, 
you're the perfect person for this role. And she's being sarcastic, but she says, you know, you're very angry. You have a lot of anger. And Will, he plays a fool in saying, well, why would I need to be upset? She says, these same individuals, they killed your mother. They killed your father in the massacre. You should be very angry. And he says, I'm not angry. Will is at the point now where he's making his rounds throughout a neighborhood as a cop. And he's looking at the neighborhood and he's watching people. And as he's doing this, he feels and sees the imagery of his mother playing the piano, trying to keep him distracted before the massacre. So he keeps seeing that vision haunt him and follow him around. As he's doing that, he walks down the street and he sees a white man with a bomb cocktail in his hand. And he's about to throw it through a store, which is clearly, they want us to see that this is a Jewish star because they had the star of David in the front of the star. And he says, hey, you know, wait, what are you doing? And he says, well, hey yourself. And he proceeds to throw the cocktail through the store if as he's unfazed and this black cop means nothing to him. And Will continues to fo follow him and says, excuse me, you are under arrest. And he says, <laughs> under arrest, huh? Well, what makes you think that they're going to believe you? They're going to believe you or they're going to believe me? And Will's not trying to hear that. He goes on to arrest him and take and takes him down to booking. When he gets the, to booking, he starts to tell the bookie, hey, this guy, I just him saw him commit arson with a store. I'll let you know the store's location, but we need to go ahead and get this guy booked. And the white man says, well, no, I didn't do that. He's clearly having some issues and he's just saying things out of the side of his head and I did no such thing. And he proceeds to call Will these racial slurs and these white cops come up to the side and you think that they're about to stand up for him and they say, well, what did you just call this officer? And he says, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. And he says, apologize to your local officer. And they make him apologize to Will. He apologizes and he says, you know what? I'll go ahead and take care of this. He looks to the bookie and he does this symbol and he does that. And the bookie says, well, okay. And Will's just like, well, what, what is he doing? He's like, well, you know, they got this. He said that they got it. And the bookie is confused because he's like, well, Will arrested him. And they're like, no, 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 we got it. Will wants to keep going along and not to th think too much about it and he exits the building and he sees a gentleman at a newsstand and he's reading a comic book of some sort and he's like, oh, is it a good read? And the guy says, yes, yeah, this story about this guy, you know, he puts his son, or it's a story about a baby, and he puts his baby on this space shuttle and he, you know, catapults him out of this earth, you know, to protect him from being attacked, you know, and it's similar to what Will experienced when he was a child, when his father bundled him up to, to get him out of a situation. But as he's learning about the story, he's bumped into by the same guy that he just arrested. And he gives a little tip of the hat as to say, well, I'm out of jail and that didn't faze me. And he's very upset. And Will just goes back to the precinct and he goes to the bookie and he says, what? What, what's up with the guy that I just arrested? He's already out, what's up with that? And the bookie says, you know, don't make a scene. You know, just try to forget about it, going about your way, just try to forget. And Will says, no, 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 he's already out already. And I saw him with my own eyes commit arson. And what is this? I saw them do a symbol, what is that? And the bookie says, look, just ignore that. Be on your way, I'm trying to save your life. Now just forget it. Just let, let it be left alone. Just leave, just go. And he gives this firm look at Will like, please don't say anything else. And Will's upset about this point and he just leaves the office. He leaves the building because he doesn't know what to think about the matter. Will, he's off from work, he's walking home. And as he's walking home, he is still haunted of that vision of him playing the piano before the massacre. And he's trying to forget that and he's walking home. And as he's walking home, he sees those same officers that said, we got this, that was doing the symbols before they took the guy to be placed in jail. And they slowly pull up to Will and they say, well, hey, do you need a ride home? And Will says, no, I, I don't need a ride home. I'd rather walk. And the cops say, well, are you sure? Because we can take you home. We can make sure that you get there. And he says, no, I, 
I'd rather much walk, maybe next time. And the cops say, well, okay, well, maybe next time. And they start to drive off. And when they drive off, Will sees the image of the same thing that he saw when he was a child of the Klansmen that were dragging black men with their vehicle. And he shakes it off and he tries to get it out of his mind. And he has a bad feeling, bad energy. So he doesn't want to keep walking down the same sidewalk that he was walking down. Instead, he wants to make a cut, you know, a shortcut and go down an alleyway. And as he's walking down the alleyway, those same cops cut him off with the car. And they slowly start to get out of the car and they look at Will and they say, Will, you know what? We don't want to wait till next time. And they start to beat them up and drag them and kick them. And the next scene that we see, he is at a tree and they have his arms tied up and they have a noose prepared to hang him. And they tell him, you shouldn't have been nosy. We're going to take care of this. And Will is saying, no, please don't do this. And he already looks defeated as if I'm about to die. They're about to hang me. Why even fight? And he's bloody and he can barely see. And they proceed to cover his face with a black bag, but he can kind of see through the bag. And as this is happening, we see flashes of Angela to remind us that still Angela is seeing this memory through nostalgia and Angela is huffing and puffing. So she is seeing and feeling the adrenaline of this moment. And they put the noose around his neck and then they start to hang him from the tree. And we can hear, hear the gargles and we can hear him struggling to breathe. And he's starting to black out on the brink of death. And as he's about to pass out, they cut him down and they take the bag off over his head. And the police officer says, you know what? Think again before you start to get nosy and asking questions about what's what. Because we cut you down this time, but next time we won't cut you down. So they let him go, but the, he still has this noose around his neck and he's still holding the black bag in his hand and he is traumatized walking slowly, trying to get home and distorted a little bit. And he's just completely in shock about what has happened. But on the way home, he sees a white couple being robbed and beat up very badly. And he freezes and he thinks about it. And you can tell that he's conflicted. Should I save this couple, not only this couple, this white couple, and what I've just experienced, this violence, this racism, this white terrorism. And he no longer thinks about it. And with the black bag that he has in his hand, with his thumbs, he's piercing these holes in the bag. And he's making holes in the bag so he can see. And he puts the bag over his head to protect his identity. And then he goes in to start a fight and to beat up these robbers who are robbing and beating up this couple. And when he does it, when he's finished doing that, the couple says, oh my God, thank you. It's because of you. Thank you so much for saving us. And they just take off because they're scared too of what just happened. And Will has this traumatized look, look again, like I can't believe that just happened. Will finally gets home and he sees June and she sees the, the bloody mess of a face. She sees the noose around his neck. She sees the rope that he has in his hand and the black bag. And he looks her in the eyes and he says, I am, I, I'm angry. He passes out. That next day he wakes up and you could tell she's cleaned him up. And he's asking, what time is it? She says, it's 3 p.m. I've gone to work and I've come out back. So that lets us know how long Will was out. And she says, you know what? Will, you're a hero. You've been in the paper. And she looks at the paper and she says, this article explains that this hooded hero saved this couple. And this couple has told the, the newspaper people that because of you, it's no telling where their lives would be had you not saved them. And she says, Will, what's the name of the picture that you always used to tell me about 
when you were a little boy. It's the same movie that you would watch over and over again. What was the name of that movie? What was that? And he says it's called Trust in the Law. She says, yes, trust in the law. So what happened at the end of that movie? Can you remind me? And he says, well, in the movie, it's this black hooded fabric over somebody and they're chasing the sheriff and he's chasing the sheriff and with a noose, he captures him and pulls him down and people come out of a building, this white, these, these white people. And they said, well, what are you doing with the sheriff? What are you doing? And he says, this sheriff is guilty of stealing and not doing right of the people. And the people are saying, reveal yourselves. Who, who, who are you? And he pulls the hood off and you see this black man and he's letting him know he's the deputy Reese, you know, Reese and Reeves. And he's telling them who he is. And he's just like, this man has done wrong. And, and the people are cheering and they're saying, yes, and we must hang this man and put him up. And deputy Reeves says, no, we won't do that type of stuff. We're going to trust in the law. And June says, those people, they were white. And what did those same people do when they attacked black people in the massacre? He was like, they were, they were white. And he says, okay. And what happened to those KKK members who killed all those people? And Will doesn't say anything. And she says, this hood, what you did, this is going to be your justice. You've got to use this as justice. But how you'll get the justice, they have to think it's one of their own. And she proceeds to paint his face, but she paints the eye area resembling white skin. So if they see him, they can conclude that this is a white vigilante that is getting this justice and nothing will happen to this vigilante because he's white. So she says, as long as you're protective, you must cover up everything else and they can see this. But if they think it's one of them, then you'll get that justice. This is how you're going to get it. We hear a narrative of Will saying, now that he has this idea of this hooded hero, he knows exactly who he's gonna go to first, and it's Fred. And Fred is the guy that pretty much almost killed him when trying to hang him from a tree. And he wants to follow him to see what he's doing and to see if there's a certain particular area of where the clan is hiding or other bad things that he's involved in. And he's watching him from a rooftop, Fred and other officers. And he goes to a building and there's a building and a door to where you only get access if you know a password or, or if there's a certain symbol. And when they get to the door, all of the white gentlemen them and they hold up that sign to their foreheads and they're entered in they're allowed to come in and will goes down he gets to that door they open up the secret area where they can see the face and will punches his way in and he proceeds to just beat everybody up in there and just taking three to one and he's just trying to nail all of them down and there's one more person left and as he's fighting that person, they end up falling into the neighbor wall that's next to this room. And it's a market. And there are people inside of the market who are shopping. And we see the lettuce symbolism in the area. And the same guy that committed the arson is the same employee of the store. And he's just like, what the heck is going on here? And Will knows that he has to escape. There's no other way for him to get out. And he proceeds to blast his way through the glass. And we see this amazing cinematography shot of him going through this glass. And there's a slow motion vision that pans all the way around. And then we hear a voice of Agent Blake, Angela, Angela, we shot you with some adrenaline so we can get you out of this nostalgia before you go into the coma. And also your eyes are open, so it's a bit creepy, but yeah, if you can hear me, I need you to blink. And Angela is in this frozen state and she tries everything to blink and she says, great, I'm glad that you can hear me. Now that you can hear me, we need to get you some information so you can snap out of this, so you can remember who you are and you can get out of this thought 
this deep nostalgia that you're in. So the next shot that we see is Calvin. We can barely see him and he's reading this piece of paper. And he says, Angela, this is your husband. My name is Cal, remember? It's 2019 and I need you to come back. I need you to get out of the state that you're in. I'm I'm Cal. And he's saying this over and over and again so she can remember. He's like, you have three children. Here are their names. And we see that this memory is slowly trying to pull out, slowly trying to get her out of it. But instead of coming out of the nostalgia, she has more visions. We go back into more nostalgia and we see Will and June, they're having dinner, they're sitting at the table talking and all of a sudden they hear a knock at the door. She goes to the door to answer it and it is a white man and he says, well, hello, is your husband home? I need to speak with your husband, it's very important. She invites him in, he introduces himself as Nelson Gardner and he says, well, hello. I needed to talk to you about what's been going on and these hooded, you know, men that are going around and, you know, capturing people who are bad and they share a handshake that's awkward, but they look at each other as if sexual tension is, you know, in the room or they can feel it, but it's quickly stopped and they sit down and he says, well, Will, there are some individuals on, and on behalf of Captain Metropolis, um, we want to invite you to fight this endeavor with us. And we have different costumes and we feel that this person, AKA Hooded Justice may need our help. And we feel that it's you because every time something happens or something's infiltrated, it's information that's fed through the cops. And the only person that would be able to get that or to have that access is you. And June, she laughs it off. She tries to play it off like, you know, that's crazy. You know, I don't know why, how you come into this conclusion. But Will, he's not laughing and he seems very interested. And he says, well, these so-called people, you know, these Minutemen, you know, um, how can I trust them? And June says, yeah, are they blonde haired like you? I mean, how do we know that we should even listen to you? And she seems like she's getting really steamed and angry that Will is even considering listening to this man. And he says, well, yes, we really feel that you would contribute to the Minutemen. And we feel that the only person that's missing from this journey is you. And he slides him a card to c contact him. And once again, they touch hands and it's this sexual tension that's felt, but they quickly stop because of course June is in the room. And she looks heated that he's still listening to this guy. And she looks at him and she says, no, don't do it. You can't do this. And the next scene that we see is Will and Gardner having sex and they're lying in bed and he's telling Will, look, we need you in this endeavor and we feel that you can be part of the team. And Will says, well, how did you know it was me? How did you find out that information? And he says, well, you know, we have our sources and I had a feeling and I knew once I met you, I knew that it was you. We had some ideas of who it could be, but I knew that it was you. Now, when we start to do this, the only catch is, is that I need you to stay hidden. I need your secret to stay a secret. And when he says that we're thinking because of people who are homophobic, but in actuality, he's talking about, we can't let anybody know that you're black. And he lets them know, stay covered, keep painting your face like that, stay covered up. I am welcoming of who you are and your skin color because you're beautiful, but the other minute men, not so much. They might not be so mm, welcoming. There's another day when we see Will and June and they're in bed. Only this time, Will is having a difficult time making love to her. And she doesn't know what to read from that. And she's thinking that he's concerned about this new guy, Mr. Gardner, coming in and feeling thoughts in his head about being hooded justice. And she says, you know, you're, you're worrying about all this other stuff and should you join these Minutemen? But to take your mind off of that, 
tell me about the first time you saw me. Tell me that story again. And Will says, when I saw you, before I saw you, I was looking at Tulsa burn all behind me. And then I heard a baby cry. And when I heard a baby cry, I went up to it and I held you. So then we know that that person is June. And he says, I held you and I looked into your eyes and I told you to stop crying. And you stopped crying. And she says, wow, well just don't give me a reason to cry. And also just don't because I'm pregnant. And Will has this look of fear and confusion at the same time of learning this. But we see the dynamic and the trauma that he's still dealing with, not only from just having a homosexual experience and letting it out that he's had those feelings, he's, he looks very, very conflicted. Will is suiting up, he's putting his makeup on, and as he's doing that, we see all these different articles that he's retrieved that are on his mirror about the KKK and proof that the KKK has bombed different churches and it's terrorism and all these different things that have happened. And he collects all of the articles and he puts them in a folder with the symbolism of an eye on the front. And as he's doing this, we're hearing a press narrative in the background saying, oh, Metropolis, Metropolis, take turn here, take a picture, take a picture here. So we know that he's getting prepared to go into this press conference. And when he walks in, the press people saying, oh, you know, this, this new vigilante, who is he? And Metropolis is saying, we've added someone to the team. This person is, is, is hooded justice. He's with us and we're glad to have him aboard. And they say, well, you know, who the justice, what do you have to say? What do you have to say? And we're hearing the clicks and the snaps of the press getting all of their photos. And he says, I'm working on something and I have enough proof and incentive to go after this particular group and I know about all of their attacks and here and Metropolis cuts him off and says, oh, well, you know, yes, what we're going to do, we, we have some information about someone that's, you know, he makes up this story, he cuts him off. And Hoodie Justice is standing there confused about why he's cut him off and didn't let him proceed with the story and that he made up another story to take that place to cover that up. And as he says that, Metropolis says, in the meantime, let's check out this promotional um, issue for the National Bank. And when he does that, he unveils this hero that's holding a black person with all of these racist caricatures in it. So now Will is in this place of, I thought I was helping, I thought we were gonna have justice, but they're still celebrating racism and they don't wanna do anything about it. And he's frozen in shock again. Shows Will putting on his makeup and to give us a time frame of how long he's been doing this, we see his child go from baby to toddler. And now it looks like he's about five years old and he's still putting on the makeup. So that lets us know he's still been giving some type of justice in the streets and that he's been doing that a while. So we can guess that he's been doing that for about five or six years because the young boy looks to be about five or six years old. And as he does that, he's still keeping the persona of the day job of him being a cop. So nobody knows his true identity. And one day when he is on the beat, when he's on his walk, he sees that there's this theater in flames and there's smoke and people are injured and a lot of black people are being arrested and they're throwing them in police vans and trucks or not a van, a truck. And Will says to one of the officers, what happened, what's going on? And the white cop says, well, you know how they are, saying they as if Will isn't a black person. Well, you know, once you get them all in one area, you know, they act crazy and they start attacking each other. You know, they can't have anything. And he says, well, you know, you go in there since you speak their language and let them know that they need to exit the building. And Will, once again, he's conflicted about what to do, but then again, he's curious about what the heck just happened. You can tell people have been fighting. It's blood all over the place. When he enters the theater to try to tell people to get out and at the same time trying to ask somebody what the heck happened,
He sees a woman there and she's crying. We see dead people in there. We see blood. And he kneels down to talk with her. And he says, hi, um, Will, I just, I'm an officer. I need to know what happened. And she's in tears and she can barely get her words together because she's just in shock about what just happened. And she says, we were sitting down and we were about to watch the picture. And all of a sudden there was flickering light. And then I just started hearing voices in my head that kept telling me to attack people. They kept telling me to hurt people. And we could see that her eye has been hit and she's bloody as well. So we could tell that she's been in a fight. And she says, I just don't know what happened. It's just this voice in my head and just kept going on and on and on. And he cuts her off and he says, okay, because he notices in the background, there are two white men that are carrying a camera and they're going outside with it. And Will follows them outside of the building and notices that these two gentlemen are putting this film camera in the back of a van and he's watching them and he's observing them. The next cut, next cut that we see, he's on the phone and we can assume that it's Metropolis or somebody of the Minuteman and he's telling them, I followed these gentlemen. They took the camera to this, you know, this meat factory and I followed them there. And they had books and it correlates with with mind control and, and, and all of this stuff. And the voice of the phone says, mind control. You know, you got to remember this happened in Harlem and you know how they are there. When they have those riots, it's because they want to do that and they want to hurt each other. And he's just like, no, you know, they were saying that they were hearing these visions and the guy over the phone is saying, no, 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 no. Will, this sounds crazy. This is a conspiracy. You know how crazy you sound that they were watching something and all of a sudden that they went crazy. You got to be out of your mind. You know, just no, forget that. And he says, I think it's all related. All of the stuff that I saw is going hand to hand in hand. And they're like, no, Will, what you saw, you know, no, it just, just stop it. And he in frustration, Will slams the phone down. And when he slams the phone down, the same white man that he arrested earlier in the episode says, oh, rough day. You know, I know how you are. You guys are, you know, you just, you fight all the time. And, you know, and he's just saying all these racial slurs and all of these bad things. And he says, you know, you ought to come to my meat factory and get a steak. You know, his guys like you, you know, you guys, you know, you have a lot of meat. And he's saying these racist things. And as he's saying it, Will is just getting angrier and angrier and angrier, standing there listening to him. He says, you know, you ought to come to, you know, get a steak. And Will's saying that this meat factory, that's, that belongs to you over there? And he's like, yeah. And he continues to go on and on and say more racial slurs. And he's just egging him on and egging him on. And Will is at his peak he is at the level of anger and he proceeds to just shoot the guy in the head and he makes his way into this meat factory when he goes into the meat factory he bursts in he still has on his police uniform but this time he has on the black hood with the holes poked through the front and he goes in and he sees all of these cops and kkk members they're loading all of this stuff and before he can say anything he's just shooting them all he doesn't have time for questions he just needs to just know that he needs to just go in there and regulate he's just starting to shoot everybody everybody that he sees and he gets to this area where he sees this table with camera mechanisms and blueprints about mind control and he sees these crystals and he sees all these different things on this table and then he goes back to this back room and he sees a man with earbuds on listening and recording audio saying over hurt each other don't hurt anyone don't hurt any white people kick each other, uh, uh, you know, on the brink of death, just keep going until you see blood, you know, uh, hurt every Negro you see. And he's saying this over and over and over again. And as Will goes to take a kill shot, he's out of bullets. 
and the guy doesn't hear that of course and he hasn't heard what's in the next room because he's had on these earphones the entire time and Will has no other choice but to go ahead and strangle this guy he strangles him to death and after he's done that, he's gathered up all of the people that he's killed and he pours gasoline on all of them and proceeds to make a fire. And before the fire gets out of control, he gets one of the cameras and he gets, the, the, you know, he gets all of the things as proof of what he just saw. And he's watching the flames. And it's a correlation of him watching Tulsa burn and now his justice watching this factory burn to death and burn down and we see the vengeance and we see the anger in his eyes as he's watching this building burn down will gets home he sees his son dressing like him as hooded justice he's putting the makeup on he has the noose around his neck and will snaps and tells his son no 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 no, you're not gonna do this and he has this force forgetting that this is his son and Jew walks in and she just says you know when you did this I, I i told you not to do this i told you not to go into and help this group and everything you were just supposed to be getting justice for yourself but now i see you've lost yourself you don't even know who you are and I, I can't do this anymore and I am going back to Tulsa and Will is telling her you can go back but I am not going back there I am not going back to Tulsa and he has these visions of what happened to him as a as a child so there's still trauma there and we know for a fact he's not going back because he is hurt even though the wife is saying we're going to Tulsa I've had enough of this he has enough trauma to where he's saying I'm not going back and he's reflecting on I could still do something with this I could still maybe have some type of incentive of still getting justice. And the next shot that we see is current time and the scene of Will as an old man in the wheelchair. And we see the shot of Judd when he's going down the street and his tires are flattened by the spikes in the road. And as Judd gets out, he sees that light. It's the scene where we see him blocking the light. And Will is not only showing a light, but a flickering light. And he's bringing Judd closer and closer to him. So we know that he's using this same mind control lighting that's getting Judd to come closer to him. And we see that Will is flickering the light in his face, in Judd's face. And he's luring him to that same tree. And he's telling him, you will do exactly what I say. You will listen to everything that I say. And Judd is, Judd is repeating back, I'll do anything that you say. I'll listen to everything that you say. Continuously pointing the light, the flickering light in his face. And he stops the light for a second and he talks to Judd. And he says, everything that you've done there's even a KKK uniform in your house. It was found in your house. Everything that you've done. And Judd says, you know, that uniform that I have, that's my legacy. And, and that's up to me to keep. And I've always tried to do nice by you people. And Will proceeds to say your legacy and what you tried to do. And he cuts the light back on and it begins to flick, flicker. And he says, you know, now you can hang yourself. And as he's saying that, we see the visual of Angela. She's still watching this nostalgia. So it's reminding us that she's seen all of this. And Will hands him the rope. Very calmly, you'll hang yourself. And Judd gets the rope and he's putting it up on the tree and he's listening to everything Will is telling him to do. And he steps up, he puts the noose around his head and he proceeds to be hanged. And Will has this look of satisfaction in knowing, I know exactly who you are. I know exactly who your grandfather is. We see all of the imagery of what Will knows until Judd dies from hanging from this tree.